Stoichiometry. This word strikes fear into the hearts of many beginning chemistry students. If you've struggled with stoichiometry problems, you've come to the right place. Welcome to Hovercraft Physics and Chemistry for the ultimate stoichiometry hack, the BCA chart. BCA stands for before, change, and after. Luckily, all that you need to be able to do to use this method is you need to be able to balance the chemical equation that you're working with and you need to convert all starting quantities to moles. If you don't know how to do those two things, those are a topic for another video. But if you can do those two basic chemistry skills, you should be able to get every stoichiometry problem correct using the BCA chart method. A typical stoichiometry problem will provide you with some sort of chemical equation and starting quantities of the reactants. Most often, you have to predict how many grams of product will be made. Just a hint here, the answer is not 100 grams. The BCA chart will help us organize our thinking and understand why 100 grams of product is not produced. Again, the first thing that you need to be able to do is balance the chemical equation. This equation is not balanced. Now we can see that the equation is balanced. We have two nitrogen atoms in the reactant side of the equation and two nitrogen atoms in the product side of the equation. We have six hydrogen atoms in the reactant side of the equation, and we have six hydrogen atoms in the product side of the equation. To do the BCA chart, I need to give myself a little bit more room. In order to use the BCA chart method, we need to make a line for B, that stands for before, C, that stands for change, and A, that stands for after. I usually do it like this. Now before the reaction happens, there's no product. So what I'm going to do here is simply write zero grams. Now in the preview to this problem, we said that we need to first balance the equation, which we've done. And then we need to convert all starting quantities to moles. The reason we do that is moles is our counting unit in chemistry. Let's go back to our diagram to think about why we need to convert the gram amounts to moles. The way we interpret this equation is to say that one N2 molecule reacts with three H2 molecules to make two NH3 molecules. We could scale it up with any unit to make the reaction bigger. We could say that one million N2 molecules will react with 3 million H2 molecules to make 2 million NH3 molecules. But in chemistry, our counting unit is the mole. So another way we could think about it is that one mole of N2 molecules will react with 3 moles of H2 molecules to make 2 moles of NH3 molecules. That's why we have to convert from grams to moles to do this type of analysis. Now I've added some additional information to the screen. We have the entries for hydrogen and nitrogen on the periodic table. I've used these numbers to calculate the molar mass of the N2 molecule and the H2 molecule. Adding up all the components of an NH3 molecule will be 17.04 grams in one mole, and I like to jot those numbers down above the chemical reaction. I'll use those values to convert the 50 gram amounts to moles, because moles is quantity and I want to know how the quantities of each of these molecules re will react with one another. I'm going to do a little side calculation to calculate how many moles of N2 I would have in 50 grams. Using a conversion factor, it's going to look like this. I would do a similar calculation to figure out how many moles of H2 are present in 50 grams. I'm going to keep some extra significant digits. And of course, zero grams of NH3 is also zero moles of NH3. Let me clean things up again. 
I really want to highlight the mole amounts present because that's quantity. Notice that although we had equal masses here, in terms of quantity, we have many more H2 molecules than N2 molecules. And that's because an N2 molecule is pretty massive compared to an H2 molecule. So I've got a lot more H2 in that 50 grams than I do N2. That's our starting point. Now we need to think what happens when this reaction happens. Every one N2 molecule needs to react with three hydrogen molecules. So we can't assume that they're going to react perfectly and use up all the reactant. Let's just start with a hypothetical. Let's consider that the change that occurs is that all 1.784 moles of N2 gets used up. So I'll write minus 1.784 moles, meaning that 1.784 moles of N2 gets converted in the course of the reaction. How many moles of H2 would react with that? Here's where I take into account the coefficients in the balanced chemical equation. It's a 1 to 3 ratio. One molecule of N2 is going to react with three molecules of H2. And moles is quantity, so three times as many moles of H2 must react. I need to take 1.784 and multiply by 3. I'm going to show that calculation using conversion factors, just so you see what I mean. The 1.784 moles is moles of N2 reacting. The ratio that this must react in is 1 mole of N2 needs to react with 3 moles of H2. Moles of N2 will cancel, and of course I'm just multiplying by 3. You might not need to do that step, but I wanted to show it just in case. So 1.784 times 3 is 5.352 moles. And that's moles of H2. What I'm saying is if 1.784 moles of N2 reacts, I would also react that with 5.352 moles of H2. Let me clean that up a little bit. How much NH3 would be produced? Well, I'll put a plus sign in front because again, the change that occurs is that we create product. These two mole quantities react together. They're converted into a certain number of NH3 molecules. Now that needs to happen in a one to two ratio for N2 to NH3 or a three to two ratio for H2 to NH3. I'm gonna use the simpler of the two to quickly calculate how many moles of NH3 will be produced. Again, the ratio here is one to two. So all I need to do is take 1.784 moles of N2, multiply it by 2 to figure out how many moles of NH3 is produced. That's 3.568 moles. So now I've figured out the action that happens when this reaction occurs. All of the N2 is going to get used up. Some of the H2 is going to get used up or converted. And 3.568 moles of NH3 are going to come together as product. The A line stands for after. What's left after the reaction occurs? For N2 it's easy. Zero moles is left. The entire quantity of N2 is reacted. We call this the limiting reactant because it effectively determines how much of the other reactant will react and how much product is created. To figure out how much H2 I have left, I need to take the starting quantity, 24.752 moles, Subtract the amount that reacted to figure out how much is left. 24.752 minus 5.352 is 19.400 moles. That's too many significant figures, but I'm going to take care of that in the final step. And it's pretty easy to determine how much NH3 is present after the reaction occurs, because that's 3.568 moles. that was produced in the reaction. Now typically this type of question would ask not how many moles of product is made but how many grams is made. So I need to do one more conversion. Just like I converted from grams to moles here, I'm going to convert back from moles to grams 
here. Now, a lot of problems would just ask you how many grams of NH3 is produced, but I wanna also calculate how many grams of H2 is left. That's one of the main secrets of this hack. If you go ahead and figure out how many grams of product are left after the reaction occurs, you should have the same amount of mass that you started with. We started with 100 grams of material and the reaction occurred. We should have 100 grams of material left afterward. Now some of it's going to be leftover H2, some of it's going to be the NH3 molecules that were produced. Let me get things set up. To convert back to grams, I'm going to set up my conversion factor like this. I'm using the molar mass again, but in the different sense where I have grams per mole. This is only true for H2 molecules. All I need to do is take 19.4 times 2.02. .02. I had three significant figures to start with, so I'm going to round this gram amount to three significant figures as well. It comes out to equal 39.2 grams. I started with 50 grams, some of it reacted, and 39.2 grams would be left. Let's figure out NH3. The molar mass of NH3 is 17.04 grams per mole. Again, moles will cancel and we'll end up in grams. If I round that answer to three significant figures, the mass that gets produced is 60.8 grams. So the great thing about this method is you always know you've done it correctly if mass is conserved. Remember, we started with 100 grams of reactant. And look what we have left. Zero grams of N2 left, it was the limiting reactant, 39.2 grams of H2, and 60.8 grams of the product, NH3. 39.2 plus 60.8 is also 100 grams. So you have to do a little bit of extra work using the BCA chart method. But if you have the time and you can calculate how many grams of reactant you started with, you must have that many grams of material left over after the reaction happens. If you get to that last step and you have a different amount of grams, something went wrong and you have to go back and find that mistake. I hope this BCA chart method will be a useful hack for you in your chemistry career. Keep in mind that different stoichiometry problems might give you different units to start with. Grams is most common, but this is actually a reaction of gases. We could have been given a volume of gases reacting, say liters. We would need to convert liters to moles. That's the key. Moles is how we count up these molecules. So that first step is crucial. And when you start working with solution stoichiometry, you might be given a volume of solution and its concentration and you use those two values to calculate how many moles are present. But if you always start by balancing the chemical equation and converting to moles, this method will always work. If you have any questions, please post them in the comments below. If you found this video helpful, I'd really appreciate if you would subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching.